I suppose more correctly, we weren't planting a food forest at a school. We were directing uh, a number of school children to plant their own food forest. And l largely at their own uh, request too. Robin and I had gone to this school, Lumsden Primary School, which is in the heart of Southland, probably six months ago, again at their request, because I think they'd read something about the general food forest situation. That the media down here have covered our own personal food forest on our own property pretty well. And the, um, the school, and in particular the headmaster there, had... Um, had read some of these articles in the local newspaper and asked that we come out to the school and speak to the children about, about the food forest concept because they were starting to get very interested in initially just growing a few uh, apple trees because we also have the Open Orchard Project and uh, to restore the heritage orchards, apple orchards largely, of Southland back throughout the region. Um, and primarily through the primary schools, which is a very good venue for doing that. So so we went out there, Robin and I, and the whole school came and sat in their assembly room, assembly hall, and uh, listened to us while we waxed lyrical about what it's like to live in a food forest as an adult, and particularly what it was like for our three children to grow up in a food forest. And it certainly caught their attention. They were a rapt audience. We spent most of the day there after that initial talk to the school as a whole, and then we visited classrooms at the different levels, delivering the similar kind of message, but more specifically aimed at the, whichever age group we were speaking to. And whatever it was that we did there, they followed up, and they followed up very strongly. So we spent that time with those children, and really they were very switched on to it, as were the teachers um, right throughout the school, and, and primarily the principal. And then they drew in some of their parents and the board of trustees, they must have had some kind of uh, behind-the-scenes discussion about uh, ramping up their initial objective of getting some uh, heritage fruit trees planted in the school grounds to expanding that right out and um, creating a full-on one-hit uh, food forest, which is what we did today. So in the meantime, they did a lot of preparation. They brought their uh, parents in. They secured funding through Fonterra and through the World Wide Fund for Nature something like $2,000 um, one of their very active parents managed to secure. So they contacted us saying that they'd done that uh, and then they wanted some information on what, what they might spend it on. And because we were able to provide the, uh, the heritage apple trees in particular from our own open orchard project and the grafting that we do and also our contacts through our own uh, fruit tree sale, which means that we were able to bring in some of those um, varieties, particularly apricots and pears and plums, which we weren't grafting ourselves, we were able to say, well, we'll bring the larger orchard trees to you if you provide the other things, such as hazelnuts and fijoas and um, some of the support of uh, perennial herbs and so on. Um, that were, I mean, we could have done that, but that gave them something to spend their money on, essentially, which they did. And so... Today was the day that we'd booked, or they had booked for us to come. Perfect weather, absolutely perfect Southland weather. It's been dry for a couple of weeks, and so um, the ground was very easy to work. Now, what they'd done, because it's a, they are at the hub of a farming community, so we'd chosen an area of about, um, so what would I say, five, eight metres by 30 metres uh, to convert. This was playground, quite sheltered with... Um, shelter hedges down both sides and they ripped it. You, they, so one of the fathers or mothers bought in a tractor, uh, ripped the ground and disked it, I think. Whatever they did, they scuffled the ground up ready for, for planting. Uh, so when we arrived with our trees all packed into the back of our vehicle, they were already set out with the ground prepared. Their groups of children already organised. They knew they have a green team and the green team is a a uh, selection of children from, from throughout the school who have a particular interest in what they've already got at the school, which is a, um, a tunnel house and a raised bed system for raising vegetables. So they kind of moved up a grade and that green team took the lead and um, guided the whole school individually, well, as, as groups, through helping us do the actual work today, which is what we did. So, And that, that consisted of... Um, setting out a grid, a framework of 
fruit trees, apples, plums, pears, apricots, and so on. The canopy layer already exists really in that there are some reasonably close by plantings of natives. Um, we, all, we worry that they might even be a little bit close because it's a, a slightly shaded area, but, but those natives which were established probably 10 years ago are serving as a perfect canopy uh, for what we did today. So firstly, we set out in a series of four sections. We did one section after the other. Um, firstly, we set the first section out using uh, by putting in the larger fruit trees, the apples and pears and so on. And then with the same group that did that planting, and the children did the digging, although they did have some help from the parents in breaking up the soil, reasonably good soil. Um, so once, the, and, and Robin and I, our job at that point was to, to talk tree care and how to successfully plant a, plant a fruit tree. These are bare-rooted fruit trees, by the way. And so the, uh, the, the buds haven't broken down here in, in the south yet. And so we were able to, we were able to quite easily handle those trees because they're not heavy, um, not having soil around their roots. So we taught that, the children did that establishment work, and then they moved to the next step, which was interplanting with um, berry bushes, such as red currants, black currants, gooseberries, and cranberries, essentially. So then they did that, and then amongst those, they planted a lot of the things that were bought in by the parents or the children themselves, the perennial herbs, such as... Uh, cardoons, mints, various uh, herbs of that sort, broadleafed herbs, and then even some odd bits and pieces that people had bought in, such as a, a fever few plant or, you know, that kind of thing, that, which we didn't try and control at all. Everything that was bought along by children or contributed by parents or the board of trustees, we planted in, in our system. And then so we did that in a series of four stages until the, the full area was planted and as we went because the ground was already scuffed up we got the children we issued the children with um, copious amounts of blue lupin garden lupin green crop lupin and they scattered those seeds around and as well we used um, crimson clover and we sowed crimson clover at the same time we did get them at the very end to form a path or a winding path through the system. I'm just checking, James. It's you asked through. it here. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah, and so we made a winding path and we uh, purloined some um, bark chip from another area of the school where they'd done the traditional school ground bark chip garden. And so we uh, stole some bark chips from there and created a very attractive path right through the plantings that we'd done during the day. The children were on task the whole time. Um, hugely engaged and always wanting to do more, including the pruning of a rather large beech tree which was leaning over into the area where a pear tree was to grow. And one of the young boys found that I had a pruning saw with me and he beavered away there for an hour, cutting off some fairly sizable branches while his little uh, group of friends would carry these large branches off to, a, to another place. It was, really was a terrific day. Hugely successful, so we, le we left um, we left the school with that whole food forest area fully planted. Uh, well, to that point anyway. There's more that will be done there, but at this stage, all we need is a good uh, day of rain, and all of those lupins and the um, crimson clover seeds will come up through the soil. Uh, the idea being that it'll they're quite thickly sown, that it, that will um, stop the regrowth or at least slow down the regrowth of what was pasture grass or um, you know rugby field grass in that area and uh, when that happens of course the season will have changed by then and the fruit trees will bud up and the children will see quite a striking uh, result that's right yeah we also had a few trees left over um, we took quite a number up probably 30 fruit trees and so what we did was we put them out as satellites to the main uh, planting um, to kind of a lead in from the from the rest of the school to show where the food forest was, I guess a, a trail of fruit trees really, um, tuck them in amongst um, places where you might not normal ordinarily think a fruit tree would go, in a in an area of deep gravel that the children normally played in, or um, 
popping up out of a um, essentially a, a tussock, native tussock garden. So they were very amicable and very uh, open to the idea of really transforming the whole school. So Fantastic. it was a pretty exciting. Yeah, yes. it was a great, yeah. great all of us. Yeah. So um, the, um, the, I've got a couple of questions for you because um, one of the things that's really on my mind at the moment is the whole process of a, an establishment methodology. Yeah. And we've seen um, what Jeff Lawton has, has put forward in terms of a, a methodology particularly useful in um, steeper areas and, and very relevant for subtropical environment where um, you're not going to get an awful lot of useful ground cover in, in an environment like that. Yep. Um, and you know you, you need these heavy swales to, to catch the water um, and he's basically as I the way I understand it and the way that Andy um, has has described it recently developed a methodology that very accurately mimics a um, the process that a forest goes through in its establishment so pioneer species that come in get replaced by other species until you get this maturity of a of a, of a food forest or forest garden yeah if you've got the time if you've got the time and then there's the the, the method which andy himself has been um developing and working with and which he's used down in Hawaii flat which is okay well actually look we've got a really big wide open space of grass here with nothing on it we don't need to um, yep. You know, we, we base all we really need to do is to get rid of the grass, establish our own chosen and preferred and useful edible ground cover materials, ultimately, um, and plant everything into it all at once, which is kind of what you've done. My question at the moment is your your choice of those ground cover plants that you're putting in, the blue yep. lupins and green crop lupins and crimson clover and so forth, um, yep. are they mostly annuals? Uh, yes, they are. Those uh, those ones are. You know, there's a lot of different kind of lupins. And if I was doing a larger project and a project of a di different nature, not necessarily with the school, I would probably use um, the tree lupin, the yellow tree lupin that you find growing along the coast, particularly if we were doing the project nearby to the coast, which is where I live. Firstly, because they're free. You can collect them for yourself. Secondly, because they live three or four years uh, and they produce a huge amount of carbon. But in this instance, we really needed something that was kind of soft, if you know what I mean. We don't want the children excluded from that area, and the larger tree lupin has quite a gnarly sort of a, um, aspect. You know, the branches are quite different from the soft garden lupin. So there is that. The other thing, and, and you point out the Hawea experience, and I notice they're, different, they're dealing with two different things over there. One is um, dryness here in South, and in general terms, we haven't got an issue with waiting for the rain to come. It will come. It's generally reliable, so we don't have to take that into account so much. The second thing is the Hawea grasses, I'm guessing here a little bit, not knowing the area very well, are a lot lighter than ours. Southland grasses are dense, uh, so much so that they can absolutely smother out without a question anything you put into the ground, including a, um, a bare-rooted fruit tree which might stand shoulder high. Those southland grasses will still beat it yeah. because of that crowding effect, and even even overwhelm it. Uh, some of the grasses, the coxfoots, and so on, just get so big. So conditions are very different. The other thing is, um, in terms of planting in a school, you've got to think of a lot of other things as well. For example, we might not necessarily have wanted the ground to be ripped um, using machinery the way these guys did, but. You can't really call all the shots when you're, at, when you're working with a school. You've got to accept that the Board of Trustees will have a certain amount of expertise or desire, that they, they might go around and spray it with a roundup. You know, it's very hard to control every aspect. So with a school, you've got to go with the flow. You've also got to have your groundsman on site, which we did in this instance, and he was tremendously uh, useful. He's an older guy who comes in and works with the children, uh, getting seedlings established in their little tunnel house that they've got there and helping them manage their raised bed gardens and to have him on board with this um, food forest day was critical and he was fantastic absolutely fantastic and you know it's going to work later in the piece if he was to start going around with say a weed whacker 
or a ride on mower, you know, everything can be lost and I've seen it happen before. So there are things about working with schools that are very different from working with, say, a community group or on your own property. Mm. Mm. Okay, cool. Can I, can I just come back now because of this, this establishment question? What, what's, mm. just, what's the strategy or what do you imagine will happen in the subsequent year two, three and four with regards to that ground cover area and will, do you have a risk of the grasses coming back in and how yep. will that be approached? Yeah, some of the grasses will come back in, and there'll be a there'll be a need for um, children going into that site and hand pulling and reseeding, reseeding with different because we've got a whole range of uh, other suggestions uh, in terms of both annuals and perennials to go in there as seeds. Speaking with the children today and with their parents and helpers. Uh, uh, one woman, we, I was talking to about this very question about the diversity we need and that, that this carpet that we were creating on day one was just the first step. Some of it would be patchy, some of the grass would come through. She went home at lunchtime and came back with a bag full of seeds, uh, all sorts of things that she had collected herself, including nasturtiums, hmm. uh, foxgloves, all, uh, poppies, all sorts of things. And so immediately she was wanting to cast those around and I always say yes, do what you like. And so if you get that kind of um, input and buy-in, you'll find <laughs> they'll be pouring seeds onto that ground and it'll find its own, uh, its own way through. It, I'm try what I'm trying to say is it's a unique community, a school community, and you have to harness um, the particular energies that they've got. Uh, you, it's not just a matter of having one philosophy and holding to it. It's not going to work that way. Nice. Thank you. That's that's beautifully clarifying. That answered my my questions um, amply. And and I think um, for the sake of of um, brevity and and keeping um, this to something which is um, easily accessible to lots of people, I think we should call it a close there. And and what I'd love to do is get some images if you could send some through, and I'll include those along with this and and put it out there for people to enjoy. I'll do that right now, James.